It's the last Sunday in July, and I just cannot let the month pass without reminding you that it is less than 148 days until Christmas. <laughs> when I was a kid, I remember uh, watching on TV, there used to be these uh, Christmas in July sale commercials for like art band furniture or something like that. And uh, <clears throat> I always used to think, come on, really? Like, yeah. <laughs> It, it, was a, it was a letdown for me, like kind of low-key letdown because, um, you know, you're a kid and you're thinking Christmas and, you know, what goes with Christmas? I mean, gifts, right? I've never got any Christmas in July gifts. Is anybody here? Any show of hands? Anybody ever get a Christmas in July gift? Okay. So there you have it. You're all in the same boat with me together. <laughs> um, so it... It seemed a little weird to me, like, uh, why is it that the only people celebrating Christmas in July is car dealerships and furniture stores? Uh, <laughs> well, anyway, that was when I was a kid. Now moving on to the present. <laughs> so here's the funny thing. When I originally wrote this, that wasn't intentional. But I have so many kids that the dad jokes just happen without even trying. <laughs> a, a couple of months ago, Dan asked me if I would be available uh, to share sometime in the summer, and we landed on the date of July 30th. And I said, sure, absolutely. Um, <clears throat> be glad to. And just prayed about it and asked the Lord, so what would you like me to speak about? And I uh, really felt like he was saying gifts. And I thought to myself, really? July, gifts, you're doing this to me? So it was a little ironic. <laughs> but in the same theme, earlier this month, Serena, my wife, told me um, that she'd been reading an article on MLive. It was one of those advice columns, and uh, it was about a mother-in-law who had given a rather expensive gift to her daughter-in-law and came to that realization that her daughter-in-law was not actually using it. In fact, she went over to help out with some household cleaning and found that it was stowed away in the back of a closet somewhere. And to add insult to injury, a few years later, her daughter-in-law regifted it to her without realizing where it had originally come from. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I don't know, um, hopefully never have you had quite that bad of an experience, but maybe you've had the experience of uh, giving someone a gift that you really thought it was something they could use and... Uh, you know, to the best of your knowledge, it really is sitting in the back of a closet somewhere collecting dust. Um, or maybe you've tried to give a gift to someone and, and they refused it. And you thought, but I'm, I want to give this to you. But they weren't willing to receive it. Or maybe you've received a gift and, and maybe this happened to you. You've wondered, eh, what am I supposed to do with this? Yeah. <laughs> or... Uh, I will never wear this, that kind of thing. Or, or maybe there's, uh, you know what, I really like this, and it almost fits, so instead of exchanging it, I think I'll keep it and use that as a motivation to lose a few pounds, but somehow that hasn't happened. Yeah, that was hypothetical. Um, <laughs> never happened to you or me, I'm sure. Well, the Bible tells us that God gives us gifts, right? And uh, interesting thing about God the gifts that he gives us are things that we need, and he never gives us things that don't quite fit, right? What we know we're going to need. So I want to go ahead and look at a few verses from Scripture, uh, examples that just kind of establish this fact. God is a gift giver and a good gift giver. In Matthew 7, 9 through 11, it says, Which one of you, if your son asks you for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks you for a fish, will give him a snake? If you then, though you are evil, and that means sinful, sinful fallen people, right? You know how to give good gifts to your children. So how much more then will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? And in James 1.5, it says, if any of you lack wisdom, you should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it'll be given to you. And here's the point where I realize my notes are backward. 
<laughs> in James 1.17, it says, Every good and perfect gift is from above coming down from the Father of heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. And Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. God is a giver of gifts, and he's a giver of good gifts. He does not have that problem that we have of trying to figure out what I'm going to get for this person in the family Christmas drawing, <laughs> Right? <laughs> He doesn't give something that is never going to suit the, the person or the need. But going back to those earlier thoughts of those experiences that we've had, here's a question for reflection. How often are the gifts that God has given us sitting in the back of a closet in our lives gathering dust, unopened, unused, or unappreciated. Now, going down this idea of gifts and gifts that God gives, and some of you might be thinking, okay, Dan just preached a series about, uh, we had a mini series here about the Word of God and the Spirit of God, so we're going to talk about gifts of the Spirit. Nope, that's not what we're going to do. Not where we're going. We're going to talk about the Bible gathering dust on a shelf somewhere. Well, no, but we are going to talk a little bit about the Bible being a gift. But that's not exactly all. So if you've, if you've been with me before, <clears throat> you know that I like to go on journeys. And I, I'm going to take you along with me whether you want to or not. And so in this journey, <clears throat> this one's going to involve a Catholic priest, country music, and the Taliban. So hopefully that makes sense now. Here we go. <laughs> Uh, a while back, uh, Serena, my wife, uh, my beautiful wife over here, started going to the uh, reading the Bible, uh, what is it called, reading the word, small group on Tuesday nights, which meets here at the church, yep, represent. <laughs> it's uh, back in the prayer room every Tuesday night. And uh, <clears throat> while she was there, she was uh, talking with Jessica Gortat, who also attends, and uh, Jessica mentioned a... Bible in a Year podcast that she'd been listening to. It's uh, the Bible in a Year uh, with Father Mike Schmitz. So here's our Catholic priest. This is our first stop. You might have been wondering where we were going to get there, but here it is. And uh, <clears throat> this is a Catholic priest. So in the podcast, you know, sometimes he does mention decidedly Catholic things. Um, but, you know, I don't let that bother me too much. One of the things that he says over and over again, which really jumped out at me, and really impacted me. It's kind of a paraphrase because he says it different ways, different times, but what a gift. He says, what a gift, you guys. What a gift it is to be able to read through the Bible together. And what really struck me about that is that you can actually hear it in his voice as he's saying that. He's not just saying this because, oh, I'm, you know, I'm doing a Bible in the Year podcast or whatever. He really truly means that. He feels it. And I don't know how many of you, you've ever listened to the Bible, like the, the Bible app has, you, know, you can push the play button and listen to it, and different readers have different levels of enthusiasm. Sometimes when we're reading the Bible together as a family, the kids will push the play button on the whatever device they're holding, and you know, you get chapter four, and the Lord spoke to Moses saying, you know, that, it's like, okay. But I don't know if you've ever listened to somebody read the Bible and you can actually hear the spirit of the reader overflowing with joy. You can just hear it in their voice. And that's what I was hearing from Father Mike Schmitz as I was listening to him read the Bible. I'm just hearing that overflowing joy just in his, in his heart. So excited, so joyful. Now, <clears throat> earlier this year I had also heard about a lesser-known Johnny Cash album set, and I've actually got it over here. Serena and the kids got it for me for uh, Father's Day. And um, I doubt there's very many, if any of you in here, that have ever heard of this, but this is Johnny Cash Reads the New Testament. Yeah. It's a 16-disc 16, 16 set. <laughs> Johnny Cash Reads the New Testament. And 
you know, they gave it to me for Father's Day, and I'll tell you what happened to it first. It sat in the bag, unopened. But then I got around to it. I opened it up. I started listening to it. And just right off the bat, in Matthew chapter 1, I was so impacted because I got a sense in his voice of how honored and privileged he felt to be able to read the Bible, record it for other people to listen to. And I really feel like these, these two men, without necessarily knowing it or intending it, encouraged me to feel a greater sense of appreciation for the gift that God has given me. So I really have started thinking about the scripture. How do, how do I handle this? Do I realize this? Do I think about this? What a gift that God has given me. And uh, if you've been asking, you know, that question, um, you know, what could I do to grow in my faith? What could I do to grow spiritually? I'd really encourage you that reading the Bible out loud, listening to the Bible, being read, that's a great way to grow spiritually. It's probably the best way to grow spiritually. And I'd encourage you to look into one of these, uh, these resources. You know, Romans 10 says this about God's word. It says, how... Then will they call on him who they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? So faith comes from hearing and hearing through the spoken word of Christ. And I put spoken there in brackets because there's two different words for word in Greek. One of them is logos. It means a written or thought word. And then the other one is rhema. And that means spoken out. So when God's word is spoken out, this is, you know, rocket science here, but when somebody speaks out God's word, you can hear it. When you hear it, it can come into your heart and faith can spring up from that. So we've hit our first two stops there pretty quickly. We got a Catholic priest and we got country music. How's the Taliban fit in? This one's going to take a little bit more time. And it's, a, it's about a gift, but not exactly what you might think. So um, you might have gathered that our family enjoys listening to podcasts. And a podcast that my brother-in-law actually recommended to us is a podcast called The Maverick Podcast. And uh, it's in, it, it just uh, completed season two. And this second season is actually based off of a book uh, that I have over here. It's, uh, it's called A Wind in the House of Islam. And that, that language, house, um, in, in the Islamic world, they actually refer to the people uh, who believe in Islam as the house of Islam. And so he goes through and breaks down different groups of people throughout the world in different geographical and ethnic areas and calls them rooms. He breaks them into nine separate rooms and goes through these different rooms to see the movements that God is doing in drawing people to Jesus in these communities. And um, one of the things that really comes out in here, you know, he's talking about movements that are going on in what are known as closed countries. And if you haven't heard that term before, what that means is it's a nation where to preach about Jesus, to believe in Jesus is either very dangerous or illegal. And so in these closed countries, there's things that we take for granted that they can't do or have to do in secret. Um, You know, an example of that is that we we have our baptism service coming up on September 10th. And, And what a gift it is in this nation to be able to be baptized and to make a public declaration of our faith without fearing for our lives. Because in many of these countries, if a believer is baptized and it becomes known, and you know, that's kind of the point of it, it's a public statement of your faith, right? They'll be disowned from their family, excommunicated from their community, or even worse, they might be arrested, they might be killed, just for something like being baptized. So, We were listening to this, 
uh, together as a family. And there was one week as we were listening to this that it just really struck me. Um, hit me in a different way that I wasn't expecting. And that week was uh, the uh, Western South Asia area episode. So the, the, the Western South Asia room, he calls it. So here's the rooms that he has it broken up into, and you can see Western South Asia there. That's the area of Afghanistan, Pakistan, and uh, Western India, right? And in this, in this episode, he tells the story of, uh, he doesn't use people's real names because that would put them in incredible danger, but a man called Ahmed. And the story of Ahmed is this. He was born into a Muslim family, and his father had great aspirations for him. He wanted him to be an imam, which is a, a Muslim holy man, right? And the reason for this was because they had a belief that an imam when he would die and go to paradise, he could bring seven people with him, and their family just happened to have eight people. So if Ahmed became an imam, then the rest of them would all have a ticket into heaven, right? So he was going to be the spiritual leader or the, the spiritually responsible person for their family. He was going to get them into paradise. So at four years old, his father enrolled him in madrasa, which is a school where they would study Arabic and memorize the Quran. And in his first six years in Madrasa, he was only allowed to visit his family three times. Now, after he had committed the entire Quran to memory, his father allowed him to come visit once a week. At the age of 14, he went on further in his studies. He enrolled in secondary Madrasa. And his secondary Madrasa was in the city of uh, Kebirabad, which happened to be where his older brother Nasir lived. And it was at this point in time that he discovered something scandalous about his brother. His brother had been fraternizing with Christians. And Nasir's friend Jason even tried to con convince Ahmed to learn more about Jesus. So he went back to his school and he told his teachers about this. And his teachers told him, Ahmed, you know what you have to do. You need to kill your brother and his friends. So they helped him make a plan. They got two other members of his school with him, and they said, here's what they're going to do. They're going to hide in the woods up the mountain a little way. You go, you get Jason, his friend, and you bring him up. And uh, then once you get to that agreed-upon point, they're going to jump out, ambush him. You three of you kill him, and then you go back to your house and you kill Nasir. That was the plan. So he decided to move forward with it. And he started talking to Jason, acting really friendly with him, took him around the town, and then took him up that mountain path to where his friends were waiting. And as they got there, and as they were just at the point where these schoolmates of his were going to jump out and help him kill Jason, he looked over at Jason and he saw something in his eyes and he said, I can't do this. He told Jason, we need to run now. And they ran. And they ran back to Nasir's house, and he told Nasir, you need to leave. You have to get out of this village. If you and Jason don't leave, both of you will be dead tomorrow. When he went back to his madrasa, his teachers were enraged. They said, what happened? He apologized. They told him they'd give him a second chance. So, this is what he agreed on. He was going to meet again with Nasir and Jason and another friend of theirs, Ted, and he was going to learn more about this movement of Christians that was going on in their city. So he did that. He got really close to Ted. He acted really interested in what Ted was telling him. And he, Ted started taking him to different places where different house churches were meeting. And he started gathering all this information. He would have been able to destroy the Christian movement in that city. And would have. Except he got called upon to join the Taliban. And they asked him, do you want to go to Afghanistan or Kashmir? He said he'd go to Afghanistan. And while he was in Afghanistan, his group got assigned to the different cities to enforce Sharia, which in, in their language, that just means the way. But in this context, it meant Islamic law. So he was to enforce Sharia. And some examples of what they would do is if they saw a woman out in public, they would hit her six times. If they saw a man who was not observing the call to prayer, they would whip him eight times. He remembered specifically one time where there was a man 
who they found out in the streets during the call to prayer. They whipped him eight times and then found him again and whipped him another eight times, found him again. They whipped him 24 times in total. And he cried out to them. He said, I already said the prayer at home. My wife is dying. I have to find the midwife. But they'd been trained not to care, to have no compassion. But in spite of all of this, he said there were two times during his time in the Taliban that his heart was affected by what he had done. His group was fighting against uh, uh, another group of Muslims that they had a disagreement with, the Shiite Muslims. They thought that they were uh, spies for Russia. And so they were engaged in these battles with them. And there was one time where they were tasked with going to a village and killing all of the Shia there. But they ended up killing everyone in the village. And he remembered specifically killing a little girl who was about one and a half years old. And it haunted him. There was another time where they'd captured one of their enemies and the other members of his group told him, told Ahmed that he needed to cut the man's head off. So he got the knife, he went to do it, and he couldn't bring himself to do it. He dropped the knife and he ran. They ran after him and they told him, if you don't come back, you're going to be the one dead. So he went back with them and helped them. And then as soon as he could, he went away from them and he wept. That night, he was assigned to guard duty. And while he was out on guard duty, with this turmoil in his heart, he decided he needed to run away. He ran away. He went to a nearby village. They recognized his uniform. He was Taliban. They celebrated and loved Taliban. They gave him food. They gave him a, a, a bed to sleep in. He told them he was trying to get back to his village. So they paid his train fare. They put him on a train. And while he was riding on the train to his village, he fell asleep. And they wanted to be respectful to him, so they didn't wake him up as the train passed his village. <laughs> well, they didn't wake him up until he got to the last stop. Finally, they woke him up and said, I'm sorry, this is the last stop. We didn't want to wake you. You know, we were tired and you're Taliban. We, we love you. We respect you. The last stop was Kebarabad, where his brother Nasir lived and where his brother's friends Jason and Ted were. His heart was just so heavy. He didn't know what else to do, so he found Ted. He went to Ted's house and he told him, Ted, my heart is changing. He talked with Ted for a while and he finally said, Ted, trade me. I'll give you my Quran, you give me your Bible. You read my Quran, I'll read your Bible. He went back to his home village and for a year, he spent that year reading the Bible that Ted had given him. And after that year, he had a dream one night where there was a light with a face in it. And this face said to him, I'm sending you three of my people. When they come to you, listen to them and do what they tell you. Then he had that dream a second time. And he had it a third time. And when he woke up in the morning, unannounced and unexpected, Nasir, Jason, and Ted had come to visit. He told them, Satan has me in such a dark place. I need to find the truth. And so they told him the truth about Jesus. And in 1997, he had entered the Taliban. In 1998, one year later, he was baptized in the name of Jesus. But that's not the end of the story. <laughs> That's just the beginning. 20 years later, there was a missionary couple. Uh, Joe and Donna are the names he gives them in the book. And uh, Donna realized that there were wives of men who had come to faith in Jesus. And she wanted to make a workshop for them so that they could learn to educate their children because they lived in these villages that were so far away that there were no schools available. So she wanted to help them to be able to educate and train their children. So she invited another woman, uh, Rachel, to come and join her and teach this workshop. They set up the workshop. They got a venue. 
uh, that was going to be a safe place for them to be teaching uh, about Christianity. It was uh, 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 actually a Catholic retreat center that was frequented by lepers, so people didn't want to go there. <laughs> and <laughs> um, th- everything was ready. They needed a translator, so they hired a man named Ahmed. The same Ahmed. And the next morning when the women, the 12 women were supposed to arrive to start the workshop, instead of the 12 women, they found their 12 husbands. They said, we thought about it. We changed our minds. It's too dangerous for our wives to come here without protection. You teach us what you were going to teach them and we'll take it back and teach it to them. So the, the ladies were a little discouraged This wasn't what they had set out to do, but they said, okay, well, this is the best that we've got. But immediately it was difficult. The men in that culture, there's, you know, there's such a divide in that culture between men and women, such a divide. The men were saying to Ahmed, how are these women going to teach us anything? How are we going to learn anything from a woman? Um, They sat in the class, but because of their culture, they averted their eyes they, it was not right for them to look at a woman, so they averted their eyes. The Western women weren't used to this. You know, even though they, they had dressed in traditional garb of the area to be respectful, but they weren't used to people not making eye contact with them, right? And so it was very awkward. And then they had mealtime, and the, the, the culture was that the men would sit and eat in silence. So the men sat off to one side away from the women, eating in silence. And it's at this point that I want to pick up um, reading from the book. Because I think this is just such an important part of the story. Ahmed tried to carry on a polite though awkward conversation at the other end of the table with Donna and Rachel. The conversation stumbled along until Ahmed casually asked the two women, Should we not be beating our wives? (laughs) Now, that question right there, you know, from our Western perspectives, it sounds bad enough, but the book gives a little bit more explanation of what the situation was in that society because we don't understand exactly this this divide between the men and the women. (laughs) Women were regarded, and and still are in that part of the world in many cases, regarded as property. Their value was rarely considered to be higher than a horse or a goat. Uh, Ahmed explained uh, when talking to the author of the book that in our culture, women are treated like shoes. We just wear them, and when they're old, we throw them out. And it was the case in their culture that if a woman did something to displease her husband, for example, preparing the food too late, that he might grab her by her hair, drag her through the street to the cemetery, and the men of the village would gather together and bury her alive. So that was the situation of women in that culture. And Ahmed, a man who's learned to follow Jesus now for 20 years, is beginning to question his culture. And ask the question, should we not be beating our wives? Now, it, the, continuing on from the book, the two women stopped eating. Donna said uh, to the author here, I, you know, I thought he must have been joking. So I looked up to see if he was smiling, but he was quite in earnest. So I said, no, of course you shouldn't be beating your wife. Ahmed replied innocently, well, what does the Bible say about this? Donna was speechless. She'd never been asked this question. Rachel returned to her food. Donna drank some water and, uh, before saying, let me look into, uh, into this and I'll let you know what I find. That evening, rather than escaping their cramped quarters for fast food and air conditioning, Donna insisted on pouring over the Bible. As God directed her to relevant Bible passages, she sent them by text message to Ahmed's phone in the conference center. Donna filled the hours that followed with what the Bible had to say about God's love for women and his desire for his people to love them too. She worked feverishly, knowing that the country's power grid was scheduled for an outage at any time. And when the electricity finally failed and she could no longer see her Bible, 
Donna laid back on her cot in darkness and wept. Now, I want to read, uh, I've got a list of scriptures here that she, uh, some of the scriptures that she sent to him that are from the book here, but I want to read some of the summaries of those scriptures just so you can get an understanding of what these men were looking at. Genesis 2, 18 through 24, it says, For this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and they will become one flesh. Ephesians 4, 17 through 32, You were taught with regard to the former way of your life to put off your old self, to be kind and compassionate to one another. Ephesians 5, 25 through 33, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. 1 Corinthians 13, the love chapter that we hear at weddings, right? Love is patient. Love is kind. It always protects. It always trusts. It always hopes. It always perseveres. Genesis 29, 31 through 35. This is a story in Genesis of a shunned wife, and she says, Surely my husband will love me now. Just showing that heart of a wife to be loved by her husband, that desire. 1 Timothy 3.2, now the overseer should be above reproach, the husband of one wife, temperate and self-controlled. The next morning, Ahmed explained to the two women that none of the men had slept that night. All night, he said, we were talking about these things that you sent us. We talked about what Jesus was saying about women and how we should change and how we should treat our wives. After the men had gathered in the training room, one of them stood up, and he turned his head to the side, because in his culture, it was not appropriate for others to see the tears that were glistening in his eyes. And he said, this is a little bit of clumsy translation, but you'll get what he's saying, I've made many, many wrong things with my wife, and I've been participating in the killing of women. And when the other men heard what he had said, he, they began to speak. One after another, they stood up and said, I will not beat my wife. I will not beat my wife. I will not beat my wife, and I will stop others from beating their wives. And they also added, we will tell our wives where we're going each day. A part, you know, the book also mentions that I didn't tell you about earlier was that they were taught at a young age, don't trust your wife. Don't tell her what you're doing. She will betray you. She will kill you. She's your number one enemy. That was what they were taught. But they said here, we will demonstrate trust by telling our wives where we're going each day. And they said, after today, we will treat our wives with respect. Now, it's easy for us to, you know, culturally be shocked by this story because we don't often think about what's going on in other parts of the world and how different it is from what we experience. It's easy for us to think, as we look at these men, that we would never be so cruel and that we would never be so confused about what it is that God wants from us. But I want to step back here for just a minute and look at what's going on. Jesus said to the Samaritan woman at the well, he asked her for a drink of water, and she said, don't you know I'm a Samaritan and you're a Jew? But he said to her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. I want to look at just a few, ver a few words from that verse. If you knew the gift of God, you would have. If you knew the gift of God, you would have. In Genesis chapter 2, which was actually the first passage that Donna shared with Ahmed, it tells the account of how God had created a woman to be a companion for the man he had created. He brought her to him and presented them to each other, gave them as a gift in the first marriage. If you knew the gift of God, you would have acted differently. The problem here was that these men probably were not especially cruel by nature, it was their culture and their upbringing that had blinded them to the gift of God. And we deceive ourselves if we think that we are less capable of error than these men were. 
Here's a question for you to think about. In what way has our culture been blinding us to the gifts that, of God, preventing us from receiving, enjoying, and appreciating these gifts the way that God intended? Ahmed asked a question. He said, should we be beating our wives? That shocks us because our culture didn't blind us in that way. But what are some of the questions that we might ask? We might ask, should we not be resenting our parents? Should we not be holding grudges against people who've wronged us? Should we not be harboring unforgiveness toward an ex-spouse or you know, a current spouse for that matter? <laughs> Should we not be hating our enemies? We've been blinded by our culture in a way that makes us think that some of these behaviors are acceptable and that they're right. But what is God saying about that? And do our actions toward the people that God has put around us demonstrate that we've really understood the gifts of God that they are? If you knew the gift of God, you would have acted differently. Ahmed and the other men realized that they had not been recognizing the gift of God, and they committed themselves to change. Let's do the same thing. If, you, if you're willing, I want to invite you to go ahead and pray this together with me. There's going to be a prayer up on the screen and you can join me in it. I'm going to pray it and you can follow along. God, show me the gifts that I have not recognized or that I have mistreated. Help me to see them as the gifts that they are so that I may receive them from you and properly appreciate them. And now as, as you talk with God about this in the days to come, because I, I, I truly believe this is not just going <laughs> to suddenly leave your minds in 15 minutes, but I, I pray to God that this sticks with you throughout the week. And as you talk with God about this in the days to come, I encourage you to thank him for the gifts that he is showing you. Lord, thank you for the gift of your word. God, thank you for the honor you gave me by giving me these parents. Father, thank you for the privilege of being able to love this person who considers me an enemy. Ahmed said that it was not always easy for them. What they had committed to do went against their culture and their upbringing. But they had resolved in their hearts, we will do whatever God says. And it brought about a drastic change in their community. I mean, you can imagine those wives being treated like people. <laughs> what a difference that makes. <laughs> what we're committing to do right now, what we just prayed and what we've committed to, to do in cherishing God's gifts, it's going to do the same thing in our lives, and it's going to do the same things in our community. It's going to bring about a change. Do you believe it? I believe it. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord.